So this morning, I will be taught by Jason. Uh, this is my kind of my finishing assignment to see how I graduate from this class of preaching. Um, and we are very humbled to share God's words with you. Because I've always had images of women preaching and I am it has the best taste in my mouth, so we'll see. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to share with you a glimpse of the beauty, power, and relevance of God's words. The Bible is so rich and so generous and precious to me. Enjoying God more through His words, applying His words in our lives, and experiencing His power and promises so He is seen, active, and living in, in ourselves is really exciting for me. Do you read the Bible? I'm sure you read your, maybe it's your iPhone, maybe it's your Samsung phone, doesn't matter, as long as it's the Bible, read it. So, many of you probably grew up in church, or even if you're not, maybe familiar with stories from Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Uh, accounts of God's creation, Adam and Eve's sin for eating the forbidden fruit. Some might still think it's an apple. Um, or Noah's Ark and the animals that went in two by two, or Joseph with his well, technical code. Um, I claim to know this book. Um, so when the Bible study group that I am part of decided to spend 40, almost 40 weeks to study Genesis, I was like, uh, really? <laughs> Stella would know, because she's in part of that Bible study group. Uh, I was a little hesitant at first, but then I thought, sounds like a good idea to reread the book um, because how many times have you started reading the first book of the Bible because you thought, okay, I'm going to read the Bible and read from cover to cover. So you always start from the first book, right? And how many times did you have to, oh, restart? So I'm sure maybe Genesis would be the most frequently read book. So indeed, there are many stories that are familiar to us from there. So now I'm finished with that Bible study uh, on Genesis, and was I, am I glad that I was part of that? Because there was a lot of things that I overlooked. Maybe you do, but I don't. Did you know that it probably never rained before the, when before when Noah was asked to build the ark? How crazy would people think about him um, when he had to build an ark to avoid the flood? Because in Hebrews 11, 7, it says, By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fears, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Did you know that Noah actually had to wait for God's instructions to tell him to leave the boat, which was approximately two months and seven days since the dove brought back the olive branch? I thought that he could leave right away. So, that, um, how patient of Noah to wait for God's timing. Um, and so there are many, many stories in Genesis that are like this, in which you might remember Bible story books, but maybe the text says something that's, that's more rich. So I encourage you to read. Um, there are many lessons that I learned when I studied these stories of people, mortal beings, partly saintly, but God was gracious enough to include them in His plan. I hope that you will journey with me today um, to look at one of these familiar characters and his interaction with his family. We will take a look at Jacob and his sons, and as recorded in Genesis 37. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, so rich and powerful, so applicable in our lives. Um, we ask that you prepare our hearts to receive your word. Uh, may, your, may your message be loud and clear to everyone that they can take something away to apply in their lives because you love us so much. You want us to, to obey you and to love you um, and to have faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to leave you to read the whole chapter of Genesis 37. Do you have that? That's good. I will start. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, 
Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Silpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other son, because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably on him, to him. Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheets of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheep stood up, and your sheep scattered around it, and bowed down to my sheep. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, but his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is that? Is this that you have said, that you have had? He said, Are your mother and brothers and I going to bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. His brothers had gone to pasture to their flocks, father's flocks at Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers, you know, are pasturing the flocks at Shechem. Get ready, I'm sending you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. Then Israel said to him, Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing, and bring word back to me. So he sent him in from the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. A man found him there, wandering in the field, and asked him, What are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph said. Can you tell me where they are pasturing their, their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man said. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph set out after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him in the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes that dreamer. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. <coughs> when Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, Let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, Don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from the hands and return him to his father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. They looked up and there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam and resin going down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. When Midianite traders passed by, they pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for twenty pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy is gone! What am I going to do? So they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a young goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They sent the robe of many colors to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? His father recognized it. It is my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal had devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. And his father wept for him. Meanwhile, Midianite saw Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. Um, so here's an account of Joseph's family. Some say that every family is unique, but everyone would have their challenges. How is your family like? Do you see any similar traits as in Joseph's family? Sibling rivalries, parents playing favorites? How do we cope? So maybe we'll go back and take a look at Jacob first. So who is he? Jacob, son, he's the son of Isaac and Rebekah, the product of favoritism by his own mother, 
disfavored by Isaac, his father, who preferred his brothers. He was the younger son who ran away to Uncle Laban to get married, but was tricked to work seven years for a wife he didn't want, Leah, and another seven years for the wife he desired, Rachel. Besides having two wives, conceded to have, he conceded to have their maids as well, Bilba and Sopa, to be his wife. He uh, played favorites with his wife and caused much dissension in the family, and I'm sure the children would have noticed. So altogether, he had 12 sons and one daughter, and I'm sure you're looking at the chart of it. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to read from this chart, and it's also numbered. So we can see here on the left side, uh, the first wife, Rachel on the other side, the second wife, and the order of birth of the children. So Lear was, gave birth to four children first, and, uh, and then she stopped having babies. <laughs> uh, Rachel had to wait. She became jealous and gave, and thought that maybe my maid can help me have children, and so she gave Bilha to Jacob. And out popped Dan Nath Nathalie, number five and number six, and then Leah said, no, 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 maybe my, my slave need to uh, help my husband give, give me more kids. So then she gave Sopa to Jacob and popped out Gad and Isha. And by that time, God listened to Leah again and she gave birth to Isaac and Sopa. So you, have, you see, Rachel really had to wait a long time. Some think it's like seven years before she gave birth to Joseph. So there is some reasoning behind why Joseph was the favorite one. But you can see from here, if you read on further into the Old Testament, that Joseph, even though he's so wonderful, uh, did not give birth, wasn't the stream in which Jesus came. Jesus came through Judah, through King David. And Moses and Aaron came from the Levi's life. So this is a little good family tree for us to have in mind when we go to it. Thank you. We can check that out of the chart. Um, so now let's take a look at the relationship that Jacob had with his sons. So he had a favorite wife, a favorite kid. And um, in verse 3 it says that Jacob loved Joseph more than any other, any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob gave a special gift to Joseph, a beautiful robe. So what is that significance of the beautiful robe? So in the King James Version, it was interpreted as a multi-colored coat. There were later interpretations that it was a long sleeve, wide robe, um, because if you're a laborer, you probably can't wear a big wide robe have sleeveless coats and by giving him this long coat it symbolizes that he's the ruler, he's the supervisor. Um, some even interpret that with this jacket that he has on, he is to rule over his siblings and take over the firstborn. And being the firstborn is a big deal back then. Uh, being the firstborn you get double blessings. Um, so he was reported uh, it was. It was reported uh, he was noted that he gave a bad report of his brothers, um, and he might have fallen into the trap of being a self-righteous uh, favorite son. He was asked to, uh, to check on his brothers, and maybe then affirmed the superiority of him over his brothers. Um, we can see that it is natural for parents to relate to some kids better than others. And in Jacob's parents' case, Isaac, who had a taste of wild game, loved Esau, so we reckon loved Jacob. Um, however, this must, must not mean that some kids are being more loved than, and esteemed than others. Um, I was Googling to see if I could find anything if favoritism is still a present problem, or was, whether it was just an Old Testament problem. And there has been a recent study how parents who play favorites hurt the entire family. So it says here, in a study appearing in the Journal of Child, of Child Development, researchers led by Jennifer Jenkins, a professor of human development and applied psychology at the University of Toronto, report on the wide-ranging effects that playing favorites 
known as differential parenting, can have on not just in, uh, on not just individual siblings, but also on the behavior and mental health of all family members. They discovered or asserted that mothers who came from unstable family backgrounds were more likely to treat each of their children differently than mothers who are who had privileged up upbringings. And the more external factors a mother faced, like being a single parent or struggling with depression, the more difficult it was for her to treat her children equally. Moreover, Jenkins said that children don't mind their parents treating them differently. They only mind when they see that differential treatment as unfair, and that comes about when things aren't explained to them. So it seems that, based on this study, scientists think that there are reasons, socially and economically, for favoritism. Children may not mind if they are being told why treatment is different. Do you wonder what God thinks about favoritism? Even though God seems to be silent in this whole chapter, we know of God's view regarding favoritism from other books of the Bible. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism, James 2. For God does not show favoritism. God loves everyone, right? So we are asked to love your neighbor as yourself, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. God made us all, and we are called to love like Him. And you are thinking, hey, I'm not a parent yet, why are you telling me all this? Um, we'll stop with the parents and then we'll move to the other groups of people. So if you're a parent, how do you treat your children? Maybe you only have one child, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> do you treat them the way you were parented? Do you prayerfully depend on God to help you not to repeat the cycle if you were a victim of their um, I relate better to one of my child, but I know now that I, do, I can play favorites in the sense that I can have two favorites. I don't have to have one favorite. So that's all my problem. <laughs> um, not a parent. If you're not a parent, but maybe you are in power, you never thought that maybe if you're a teacher, coach or manager of work or you have power. Do you play fair? Do you do you treat everyone the same? In the firm that I went to they have they get feedback forms from employees. And some of the feedback that students gave was managers play favorites. And so it can be quite demoralizing when you when you have that in, in the, the organization or the place the community that you have. Um, so think about it if you are somebody in power, whether you have that trait in you. Um, so something I learned from this, from Jacob's story is, it's natural to play favorites, but when you are entrusted with power, be sure to seek divine intervention, to love those in your sphere of influence, and appreciate the uniqueness of each other under your care. Okay, we've looked at the father, maybe now we can switch the limelight and look at just the favorite one. Um, did daddy's preferential treatment affect him? Um, so, yes, he was loved by his mother, but she was also very obedient to him. Uh, poor mother Rachel probably died when he was quite young, uh, possibly around age 13 when baby Ben was born. So, he was surrounded by stepmothers, Aunt Leah, who probably hated him because of his mother. Um, his siblings hated him as well, and parents being a kind word to him. Nonetheless, when he was asked by his father to go to Shechem to see if his brothers are getting along, he readily agreed and traveled from Hebron to Shechem, which is about 80 kilometers away. And when he didn't find them, he didn't just go home, he walked another 20 kilometers to Dothan. Little, little did he know that going that extra mile caused him to be sold as a slave. So you may ask, now you painted Joseph as this poor thing, obedient child, nobody likes except his father. But what about his arrogance and ambition to rule over the family? Yes, there were two dreams that were told in this story, from first five to first eleven. Uh, and in those days, they didn't have the precious Bible that we have in our hands. God did use dreams to speak to people. So he might do that too now, but because we have God's words, we don't get as much dreams and visions uh, for the way to God speaks to us. So God used those dreams to reveal his plan and purpose to Joseph. And you will find in later chapters of Genesis that he fulfilled those dreams. 
Without those dreams, those 13 years of slavery and being wrongly accused and tossed into jail would have been impossible, impossible for him to bear. God sustained him through his dreams. But was it appropriate for Joseph to share God's revelation to his family at that point in his life? It must have been hard for him to wait for the right timing. Imagine you getting a revelation from God at age 17, what do you know? This may be a good reminder for us too, when we are overjoyed or excited about certain developments to show some modesty and only share with those who will understand we're seeking attack and hurt by sharing with those who don't. And in this case, Joseph provoked more jealousy and, hate, and hatred in his words. His father's response to his dreams was, he kept the matter in mind. And it reminds me of Mary's response to Jesus' behavior when he was young. Remember when Jesus, when he was 12, he was brought to Jerusalem to the Feast of Passover. He got lost, and when he was found, he asked, Why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Mary's response was, she treasured all these things in her heart. So, parents, teachers, coaches, when you observe such behavior in the child that is in your care, maybe make a note. Do not forget because it might be something special that God is revealing to them. And you can use that to affirm them later. Some of you may be a favorite child or a greatest pet. Be careful how you enjoy your special set status. Be sensitive to those less privileged. How can you use your position to bless those around you? Also, have you been blessed with a personal encounter with God in which He revealed certain truths or plans to you? Have you stored them up and in your heart so that you can use them to sustain you in when, it's, uh, when there's spiritual dryness or hardship. So something I learned from here is maybe wisdom is the discernment of what to share and when to share it. But can God make any good out of human weakness or sin? Like that of a parent, a favorite, or even a tactless youth. If we continue to read Genesis through to the end, we will see how God used Joseph's circumstances to train him. Even though he may be a self-righteous, overconfident, Texas, Texas teenager, eventually his dreams came true. He became the state official, only second in command to Pharaoh, the Egyptian king. He had integrity and maintained his loyalty to his master and avoided his master's wife. Um, not only did he save the Egyptians, help Egypt gain economically by selling grain to nearby countries, but everywhere there was famine. He was also used to save his own family, the family that betrayed him. Moreover, when he was reunited with his brothers, he was not bitter. Joseph allowed God to transform him, refine him in suffering. But this took a long period of training, probably 13 years before he rose from slave to a How many 13 years have you lived? That's like from K to 12. Sometimes we don't feel that school is important or even boring. But maybe, like Joseph, it can be training ground for you. Have you allowed God to use that to help you learn about the world, how to interact with people, to bless them, or just let them pass by you? Are you just letting the clock tick, waiting for the bell to ring so it's another day of school? Okay, we've looked at father, we've looked at the favorite son. What about the other brothers? Is there anything we can learn from? Um, in particular, we'll look at Reuben as well as Judah. So we note that the hatred or jealousy was built up over time. First, it may be a bad report by Joseph to his dad about the behavior of Silpah's kids, dad and Eshar, cousin Dan and Naphtali, well, yeah, cousin in uh, Dan and Naphtali that sparked it. We are unsure whether Joseph's report was slanderous or just exaggerated, or, but based on my discussion with Jason, who lived in a farming community, he told me that even a truthful report, not slanderous, can cause bad feelings. So coupled with Jacob's affection for Joseph, the brothers started to hate Joseph and cannot talk to him nicely. The young and untactful Joseph then told them of his dreams that he would be ruling over them. Certainly he did not rule well. The Bible described that as hated him all the way. So when Joseph followed them to Shechem, it was the last straw, seeing the dreamer with his long, commanding gown coming from a distance. Have you ever harbored bitterness in 
instead of overlooking our wrong, we may let it grow in our heart. Watering it self-pity, nurturing it with Satan's lies, and then without a shadow of a doubt, you became the victim of this other person's wrong. And you need to make it right now. Or what about envy or jealousy? The friend who studied with you but got better marks. Or that girl that borrowed your bread dress idea and got a ton of compliments. Or the co-worker who doesn't seem to be doing much work except chatting with his supervisor and colleagues. And then he got the outstanding employee of the month award. Or what about the person that doesn't need to train very much, is such a natural he can run a 5K and get a medal at the Robert Challenge. How did that feel? When we sense unfairness, or being overlooked, or disrespected, it can be quite disappointing or upsetting. Do we dwell on those negative emotions and let it germinate, take roots, and ruin our lives, our relationship with those around us? For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. In Joseph's brother's case, the envy, the desire to be elevated, Perhaps the same status as Joseph definitely created heated discussions about anything as to how to get rid of it. The oldest, Reuben, showed some leadership by reminding the rest to spare Joseph's life. Unfortunately, he failed to follow through and somehow wandered off and it became too late. The fourth oldest, Judah, perhaps an accountant, provided a practical approach of making some economic gains, 20 pieces of silver. And while getting rid of while getting rid of a detestable brother, this alternative may be more humane, but nonetheless they betrayed their own flesh and blood. You may note at this point that the brothers have been totally callous and hard-hearted. They continued their picnic while their younger brother was struggling and the sister trying to get out. Um, up. So to cover up their crime. The brothers had to invent a story, another lie, to tell their father. The deceptive Jacob, who schemed with his mother, Rebecca, to steal the blessing from his older brother, is now faced with the deception from his own sons. How sin trickles from one generation to another? Is there any way not to repeat the cycle? What can we learn from these brothers? Do you readily forgive or harbor bitterness? When we are angry and hurtful, not only does it hurt those we seek revenge, it hurts our Lord. We seldom consider how Jesus feels, but he's the one that purchased us, his precious blood, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Whenever I look at the cross and the grace of God that's been stored upon me, I find that I have no grounds to claim that I am right and he or she is wrong. For I am just a forgiven sinner. Needless to say, I am not justified to see my own justice. But we are sure that God will be our final judge. He says, revenge is mine, I will repay. Justice is in the hands of God. He knows, he remembers, and everyone will have to give an account on judgment day. No one is accepted. What about you? Are you struggling by unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, hatred? Do you want to continue to be a slave one? Finally, all of you should be one, of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back, back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and He will bless you for it. May you not conform to this world, or stay at what only is humanly possible, but be, tra be transformed by the grace that is demonstrated on the cross. If you are a child of God, God has called you, the church, to love, overlook, be sympathetic, be united, humble, and meek. It may be costly, it might not be easy or even convenient, but by suffering for what is right, you are promised that God will walk with you and give you the strength and be blessed. Um.
And if you are new to Christianity, may you find that God's grace and His forgiveness through Jesus um, attractive to you. Um, it is radical and fathomable by human reasoning. So here I learned that obeying what you are called to do, even if it is difficult, brings blessings.